Friends, welcome. Ruchim Abayim, welcome everyone. Erev Tov. And welcome to Elu Elu, These and These. This program was originally planned for October. I spoke about it, standing in this very place with a larger podium, uh, announcing it to the congregation with great anticipation, but unfortunately, October 7th happened and we postponed it. And so we gather tonight and this past weekend, Israel was attacked in an unprecedented way. So I'm glad we're having the night tonight because I don't know why, I don't want to know what else would happen if we postponed it again. The fact that Israel was attacked the way it was by Iran, from Iran, and sometime on Sunday, people went about their normal business. I'm sure many people were koshering their homes for Passover. It's something remarkable. A coalition of international forces came together. The remarkable technology of Iron Dome, Aerosystem, David Sling, literally kept Israel safe. We continue to live in a grim and difficult time. In our balcony, you can see there are chairs set aside for the hostages. But we really don't know how many are still alive today. But we hope. As we have been doing through the course of the year, we're going to begin this program with a prayer for the welfare of the state of Israel. So I invite you to please rise and invite Cantor Liz Berkey to lead us. Avinu Shabashamayim, so Israel Rigolo, Barechet Midinat Israel. Rishit smichat geulateinu Hagen aleha bevrat chastecha Ufros aleha sukat shlomecha Ushlaf orcha v'amitcha l'rasheha Sareha v'yotzeha V'taknem v'eitza tova milpanecha Chazek et idei m'gnei eretz kotshenu V'anchilem Eloheinu Yeshua Va'ater nitzachon te'atrem, v'natata shalom ba'aretz, v'simchat ulam liyoshveha, v'nomar, amen. Friends, you may be seated. Welcome those who are here in person, those who are joining us online. The name Elu Elu comes from a passage in the Talmud. Rabbi Abba said in the name of Rabbi Shmuel, for three years, the house of Hillel and the house of Shammai argued. One said, the halacha, Jewish law, is like this for us. And the house of Shammai argued, the halacha is like this for us. And this went on year after year until finally one day a bat kol, a heavenly voice, spoke out and said, Elu ve'elu divrei Elohim chayim. These and these are the words of the living God. This is the spirit that Tevi Troy and Rabbi David Saperstein bring to this evening and how honored we are to welcome them here. They are traveling the country to show others how to have hard discussions that are thoughtful and respectful. 
I want to thank Jackie Gilbert for her generosity and her vision in generously supporting this program. Let me introduce you to our special guests, and believe me, I have edited down their very impressive bios. Tevi Troy is a senior fellow at the Bipartisan Policy Center, a former Deputy Secretary of Health and Human Services, and a best-selling presidential historian. His latest book is Fight House, Rivalries in the White House from Truman to Trump, named as one of 2020's top political books by the Wall Street Journal. On August 3rd, 2007, Dr. Troy was unanimously confirmed by the United States Senate as, Dep as Deputy Secretary of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. He became the Chief Operating Officer of the largest civilian department in the federal government with a budget of $716 billion and 67,000 employees. Dr. Troy is a presidential historian, make him, making him one of only a few who have studied the White House as a historian and worked there at the highest levels had written so much on the subject. He writes for journals, he writes books, he is one of the most highly respected conservative thinkers in the country who also happens to be a committed and thoughtful Jew. Rabbi David Saperstein is Director Emeritus of the Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism, having served as its Director and Counsel for 40 years. He has been designated by Newsweek magazine as the most influential rabbi in America. He's the first rabbi in American history to have been designated a United States Ambassador during the second term of the Obama administration, Rabbi Saperstein served as the United States Ambassador at Large for International Religious Freedom. Rabbi Saperstein served as the President of the World Union for Progressive Judaism, the international arm of the Reformed Jewish Movement. He remains today the senior advisor to the Union. He's also an attorney. He taught seminars on church-state law and on comparative Jewish and American law for 35 years at Georgetown University Law Center. His work has been recognized over the years from many sources, and he's received a number of national organizational rewards. He is the author of the book, Thunder in America. Rabbi Saperstein is recognized as one of the most thoughtful Jewish liberal voices in America today. So let me say, just as a beginning note, that neither David or Tevi are representing any organizations. They are here representing themselves. So let's get started. We're going to break the evening into two parts. We're going to go till about 8.30. And we're going to talk first about America, and then we're going to talk about Israel. I felt that if we would have tried to combine both, our conversation with, about, with Israel would probably swamp our conversation with about, about America, because I'm trying to manage both conversations. We're going to give uh, Rabbi Saperstein and Mr. Troy 10 minutes to speak to present their views, and we are focusing on American liberalism and American conservatism. And then we're going to have about 25 minutes of questions and answers that I will uh, do my best to lead, and then we will turn our attention to Israel again with the same format. So I'm going to invite Rabbi Saperstein to begin, and can we have a round of applause for both of our special guests? What a delight to be here this evening at this great historic congregation, introduced by a rabbi who is universally recognized as one of the great um, congregational rabbis of this generation, and really honored to be with him. 
And Tevi Troy is such an outstanding Jewish public servant in America today. And uh, I have enjoyed immensely uh, the opportunity to be in dialogue uh, with an old friend here. Um, America and Israel both face crossroads as we go into the election here in 2024 in the United States. I don't know when Israel's next election will be. That's for the topic after um, uh, words. Uh, the liberal views that I'm going to espouse in my brief remarks, I believe are deeply resonant with the way Judaism in its own political theory thought about how the, uh, the state, the role of the state would be in helping to shape a more equitable, just, and fair society. Um, <clears throat> To set the context of this briefly, I want to focus on the Supreme Court and the Roberts Court. President Trump's appointment of three Supreme Court justices dramatizes that there are indeed profound consequences for elections. His appointments throughout the federal judiciary were far more conservative politically <coughs> and more conservative legally, far younger, far less experienced, far less highly regarded by their peers than his Republican or Democratic predecessors. And it has transformed the American federal judiciary. For those of you here tonight who remember the 1950s, if you do, it means you too will soon be old enough to run for president. You, you will remember the bipartisan spirit of the high court, beginning with the Warren Court, with little difference between those appointed by Republican and Democratic presidents. This moderate liberal bent, expanding civil rights, civil liberties, women's rights, affirming separation of church and state as essential to American democracy, began in the Warren Court, ran through the Borger Court, and much to the chagrin of conservatives marked much of the Rehnquist Court as well. All that has radically changed since the Roberts Court began in 2006. Until then, the Supreme Court had thwarted the priority wish list of the conservative right agenda in America, overturning Roe v. Wade, eliminating race-based remedies to discrimination, curbing the regulatory powers of federal agencies, constraining the impact of the Miranda warnings on policing, eroding the separation of church and state, giving states more authority to determine how to implement their voting rights laws and making individual gun ownership a constitutional right. Not one of those have been achieved until the Roberts Court. And just think about two of them very briefly. The 2013 Shelby decision gutting key provisions of the Voting Rights Act of 65 and the 22 Dobbs decision denying women reproductive freedom and the right to act as a moral decision maker about their own bodies and their own lives and future. The Voting Rights Act exemplifies perhaps the most compelling picture of how the Republican Party has changed in the last 25 years. After its initial passage, it was renewed and reauthorized a number of times. Overwhelming support of both parties. The last time it would, went up for a vote um, it was in 2006, where they decided it was needed for another 25 years. The vote in the Senate, unanimous. The vote in the House, 390 to 33, signed by a Republican president. Today, in its original form, it would get hardly a single Republican vote in the House and only a handful in the Senate. And what happened when Shelby came down? Immediately, immediately across the country, states which had Republican control began to limit the voting rights access that people had. Um, and so too when the Dobbs decision came down. As soon as it passed, um, the states began to cut back on any ability of functional ability of women to get um, abortions. 21, uh, or actually 23 states now have uh, passed various forms of bans on abortion, 14 of them functionally near total bans, um, and now pro-life factions in the Congress are pushing for a national ban that would bar abortion in all states. Since then, thankfully, courts, court, state courts have blocked a number of these um, bans, often against claims of religious freedom of the, to women for abortions and establishment clause um, claims. And I'm proud that a number of the plaintiffs are women and rabbis in our reform and conservative congregations. 
um, as a longtime New York Times Supreme Court watcher, Linda Greenhouse, wrote in her piece at the end of this last term of the, uh, of the Congress, look at what John Roberts and his court have wrought. She wrote, by the time the sun set on June 30th, the term's final day, every goal of the conservative wish list had been achieved, all of it. To miss that remarkable fact is to miss the story of the, re of the Roberts Court. And when you lose the Supreme Court and the federal courts as a protector of our fundamental rights, what happens in the legislative bodies, in the executive branch, becomes even more important, hence the vital urgency for this debate in the Jewish community as, to, as the 2024 election heats up and we have to uh, think about what the consequences are for America, American Jewry and Israel. So what are the liberal positions, I argue, are so resonant with the Jewish tradition, so beneficial to Jews as well as all Americans um, compared to those espoused by conservative Republicans today? Um, I already mentioned civil rights and women's rights issues. Uh, let me look briefly at just a, a, a few others here. Taken as a whole, the liberal programs permeating the 20th century had a profound impact on the social welfare of the nation. While some of the great society programs did not work out as hoped and had to be reshaped, the vast number did work and have transformed America into a far more just, equitable, and compassionate society. Let's start with Social Security and Medicare. Before Social Security and Medicare, 50% of the elderly population lived in poverty. With them, the number is just, is just over 10%, and almost all of those 10% um, who are on the programs are better off because of their benefits. And now the Republican Study Committee in their latest proposals call for changes um, that would lead to major cuts for millions. All Americans, conservatives, Repu uh, Republicans, liberals, Democrats, people of all religious or none benefit from these policies. And consider SNAP, food stamps that lift 41 million people out of hunger, school lunch programs helps 30 million children every year, the ACA that directly or indirectly increases those insured by 35 million, and now fiscal conservatives on the House Appropriations Committee are calling for cuts across the board on most of these social welfare programs. Altogether, they propose uh, reductions in social spending of 59 billion uh, below 23 level, 23 levels, plus then rescind 94 billion in already appropriated funds in the 2022 um, Inflation Reduction Act. Gun control. What manner of nation are we that in the face of overwhelming support for stronger gun control, we can bring ourselves to legislate only the most anemic responses to the bloodiest problem we face? What manner of people are we that we can accept that we've lost in the past 50 years more people to gun violence on our streets, in our homes, in our schools, in our houses of worship than we have in all the wars and all the history of our nation. Um, firearms are the leading cause of death of children one to 19 years old. It doesn't have to be that way. States pass many good laws and they get struck down by the court. But we can turn to Congress to do what the court has not yet struck down. An assault weapons ban, we did it with bipartisan support before. Stand, repeal stand your ground laws, require prohibited people to actually turn in their guns, require background trucks for private sales and end loopholes. We can do all of this um, uh, here, except that the Republican Congress and Republican state legislatures um, have blocked this um, uh, here. And so we can go down the list of a range of economic justice issues, environmental issues, immigration issues, a whole range in which I believe America would be stronger and better. Um, here, that time doesn't allow me in this opening um, to get into. But we have to make a fundamental decision about which way America is going. In another four years, of the kind of judges that we've seen supported and policies that would reverse more and more of the great social achievements of America would be a disaster for this country. And I haven't even begun to talk about the question of two different visions of America's role in the world, but that is to come. Good evening. Thank you, Rabbi Siegel, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, thank you, all of you, for coming out, for all of you online, and for this beautiful sanctuary. And I just love having Washington and Lincoln looking down upon me as I speak to you tonight. And a warm thank you to my dear friend, David Saperstein. I've so enjoyed going around the country with him, 
and having these little sparring sessions. And um, we disagree on politics. And I would say not only has it not affected our friendship one bit, but I think it's enhanced our friendship. So I think it's a great thing. I also really have to thank David for highlighting the many accomplishments of the Roberts Court. <laughs> I mean, he really did. He did a great job. He just laid them all out. Not allowing admissions decisions in college by racial quotas. Well, that's a good thing for us in the Jewish community for sure, but I think for the whole country. Giving police more powers to control crime. Well, I think we need that, especially when you look around in Chicago and other cities. Recognizing that the Second Amendment is a constitutional right. Well, it is. And we as Jews, especially after October 7th, I know many, many of us have been looking to exercise that right, especially in my community. I know a lot of Jews have looked to go out and purchase weapons to protect themselves when they fear that they might not be protected by other arms of the United States government. Giving the state's authority over elections, which protects us from having our elections governed by one body, the federal government, which leads to potential corruption and manipulation. The diversity, the diversification of having states govern elections with more authority is good for all of us. Limiting the ability of unelected bureaucrats to impose regulations that should be the responsibility of Congress, I think that's also a good decision. And then last, which I know is David's uh, favorite, but ending the Roe versus Wade decision, which imposed abortion everywhere across the country without allowing states to make any restrictions or changes, and which Ruth Bader Ginsburg thought was wrongly decided. So thank you for laying out those accomplishments. I appreciate it. Now I can get to my talk. Thank you, thank you. I can get to my talk about conservatism and what it is we're trying to conserve, because that is the essence of the word conservatism. I know conservatism is a scary word to some people, especially in the Jewish community, not conservative Judaism, of course. <laughs> that may but, be scariest still, but I don't know. <laughs> but I'm talking about conservative politics. And again, the word conserve is at the heart of it. Now, in Europe, I have my problems with conservatism, because what was conservatism in Europe? It was trying to conserve feudalism. It was trying to conserve monarchies. We have no interest in that here in America. What we are trying to conserve with conservatism and what American conservatism is about is about conserving the principles of the American Revolution. Freedom, freedom of opportunity, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of the press. This is what conservatism is about in America. I think we, as Jews, have to think about conservatism as our raison d'etre. What we as Jews are trying to do that's our goal, is to conserve our religion so we can pass it on to the next generation, midor lador. That is the goal of Judaism. We want to preserve and pass it on. Now, unfortunately, we're not always doing such a great job. If you look at the Jewish demographics, we have been stagnant in America for the last 50 years. We're not growing in absolute terms. We're not growing in relative terms. This has profound implications for us in terms of our political power in this country, but it also has profound powers, uh, implications for our ability as a community to grow. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is that the Jewish community in the world is really set in two places, in the US and Israel is where the bulk of Jews are in the world right now, and both of them are facing threats like never before. So having more Jews passing on the religion, passing on the tradition is a very good thing and something that's at the essence of conservatism. I also even though I'm speaking here in a synagogue, we're not speaking during prayer hours, because I'm very concerned about the conflation of religion with politics. You know, religion, po politics is ephemeral. Politics is short-term. Religion is forever. We have been, uh, we've had America for about 200 years. We've had Judaism for over 2,000 years. And I think we should respect that profound difference. I mean. Politics changes all the time. If you were a Democrat in the 1850s, you were for slavery. If you were a Democrat in the 1950s, you were for segregation. If you're a Democrat today, you're much more likely to be critical of Israel. So these things change over time, but the religion is supposed to stay the same and we have obligations to pass it on. Now, as this religion, as this politics changes, as progressism becomes more and more dominant within the Democratic Party and within the liberal world, I think Jews are finding themselves less and less welcome. I mean, just look at what's happened since October 7th. Uh, at Cornell, my alma mater, and uh, 
my friend Liz's alma mater as well, uh, we had a, um, uh, a professor who was exhilarated by the horrific Hamas barbaric attacks. BLM Chicago in this very city put out a picture of a hang glider, which is the sign of the Hamas terrorists who came in and killed hundreds of people at a music festival, peaceniks at a music festival. Uh, you had Cooper Union, where Jews were hiding in a library from pro-Hamas students who were looking to harm them. Chicago this weekend, as missiles were headed towards Israel, when these progressive anti-Israel pro-Hamas activists got together, they heard the missiles were coming towards Israel. They cheered and started screaming, hands off Iran, hands off Iran, in this very city. And Jews increasingly, progressive Jews are increasingly finding that they're being told to check their Zionism at the door. They don't belong in the progressive movement. And I think we need to think about that. What does that mean for us as Jews? Now, I happen to think, with my conservative beliefs, that there is a better way. The better way focuses on freedom. It focuses on opportunity, openness, American strength in the world. And I also think my friend David has way too much faith in government. He thinks government can solve all of our problems. I think we need to recognize that government imposes costs. When government tries to impose racial, racial solutions, A, it picks winners and losers, but it also exacerbates racial tensions in the country. When government tries to do all those things David's talking about in terms of redistributing income, sometimes it provides skewed incentives and people don't see the incentive to work or the incentive to marry based on what government programs are providing. Also, when you have all these government programs that are redistributing income, it takes money from one person and passes it on to other, it imposes taxes, it leads to $34 trillion in debt that I'm not sure we're ever gonna figure out how to pay back. When you have government regulations to achieve all kinds of social goods and social ends, it imposes difficulties and restrictions on the ability of businesses to thrive, to, for individuals to take care of their families. So it's not like having government as the solution for everything is cost-free. Government imposes costs as well, and I think we need to recognize that. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is something that Rabbi Siegel specifically asked me to mention, because he said that many of you like me, will be going to a Passover Seder in the next week or so. Um, my uh, wife, I'm, I'm obviously traveling today, and she, my wife is reminding me that it's only one week from now, and I should be home cleaning uh, ovens and cabinets, but uh, here I am with you, and I'm glad to be here. But a lot of people, especially in this very political, this fraught year, people are worried about their Passover Seders. What's going to happen if the Republican uncle comes and the Democratic niece is there? Will they get along? What's, go what's going to happen at the Seder? So I just want to talk a little bit about my own personal experience. When I was growing up in Queens, we had something that we annually called Seder Wars. My uncle's family would come to visit. They were religiously different than us. We were a little more, we were an Orthodox, we were conservative. Um, my uncle's family was much more reform. They would walk in and say, when do we eat? We had arguments about everything. How much of the Seder you do? Do you do it in Hebrew or English? How long does the Seder go? These wars, this tension was a constant nonstop thing. But the reason we got together, the reason we kept getting together even with these tensions, was because my grandparents insisted. They said, this is the time for family. This is the time where family sees what this religion is about, what the tradition is about. You know, Passover Seder is still one of the absolute most adhered to Jewish customs. It's the way we pass the tradition from generation to generation. And yes, maybe your liberal niece has a different view on Israel than your conservative uncle. But that shouldn't stop you from getting together and having a Passover Seder together, looking past those religious, looking past those political differences, the ephemeral political differences, and focusing on the timelessness and the profundity of the great religion that we all adhere to. And I would just say, again, to my friend David, that Seder wars are not, disagreements or politics are not, you'd be welcome at my Seder table anytime. Thank you very much. I'm going to begin with a question, and then we're going to take questions from the audience. And I want to be really clear that we're asking for questions and not statements, right? So that, um, as we say, 
we give the microphone and we can take the microphone away. So we won't really want to kind of really try to get a discussion going. And just so you get the time frame, right around 10 minutes to 8, we're going to shift into our conversation on Israel. So I want to give a little bit of time for this and then time for our conversation about Israel. But I'm going to ask the first, qu first question. The issues of our southern border and that of the thousands of immigrants that have crossed into the United States illegally is going to be one of the most contentious issues of the upcoming presidential election. Just in this neighborhood alone, right maybe two blocks from here, is the, uh, uh, is a, is the American Islamic College, which is now used as a home, a shelter for asylum seekers. While everyone agrees that the issues are untenable, the solutions are very, very different for liberals and conservatives. So first of all, how does your liberal or conservative thinking apply to this issue? And the second part of the question is, how does our tradition's understanding of the gear, the stranger, as impact your thinking as a Jew when it comes to an issue of national importance? David, I'll begin with you. So, the commandment to welcome the stranger, to treat the stranger as ourselves, to remember that we were strangers once in the land of Egypt, is the most commonly repeated commandment in the Bible. Um, and it made the argument that when it came to the social benefits of the society, the stranger who was somebody who came and lived in Israel did not convert, which was a, it was a religious state, it did not become a citizen in that sense, that they were entitled to the same social benefits um, that, uh, that Jews were entitled to. And it's a powerful message for us today. There was for a long time in America, in the post-World War II era, um, a very common bipartisan support for robust um, levels of immigration in this country. It, immigration has made this country. It made all the difference for us. Millions of Jews were welcomed here, millions of others were shut out at a crucial time. The difference of a generous um, open heart to immigrants and a closed one had a profound impact for us as it does from other, for others who are fleeing persecution, who are fleeing violence, who are fleeing um, uh, a closed door to any opportunity to provide safety and well-being to, um, uh, to their families. Obviously, no country can take in anyone. And so we've always had limits on the numbers of people who would be able to come at any given time. But the difference between liberal presidents and conservative presidents recently, but most particularly the last president, who significantly shut down um, uh, immigration, taking whole groups of people that he didn't want to allow in the country, um, uh, it was a very different kind of approach. The question of the numbers of people coming through the border is really something new um, at a level we've never seen before. And when that happens, all policies are not gonna work. So we know that there are a lot of pieces of things that has to be done in a long-term strategy. How we actually work with the hemisphere in building up societies and making them more resilient and freer and with more opportunities in there is going to be the only way eventually to stop larger numbers of people migrating. Um, secondly, is to have secure borders. Um, and I think that Democrats and Democratic leaders have recognized that there has to be a shift, that things that we would have, we would have done before when the levels were much less aren't going to work. Um, uh, here. I would point out to you that in the supplemental bill um, uh, here that would have had aid to Israel and Ukraine um, and Taiwan, 
um, uh, where the, um, where the uh, uh, Republicans insisted that border security put in, the Democrats, recognizing there was a need for change, made sweeping adjustments to accommodate and come to a compromise. Um, 110,000 um, uh, new Border Patrol people, um, a great expansion of ICE, a great expansion of the asylum um, uh, mechanisms and courts in this country to help avoid people being put into the shadows simply because they got to wait, wait years um, uh, to have their asylum status adjudicated, um, et cetera. We need that kind of structural support as you will talk about in a few minutes when we talk about aid to Israel. Um, here, the Republicans demanded it. Their representative worked out a really good deal, uh, James Lankford, a very conservative um, senator, and then they decided to put an end to that um, and not do it uh, here. And then, ironically, when, it, when a standalone bill for aid to Israel and Ukraine went through, it got turned down by Speaker Johnson and the House side because it didn't have the border stuff in it that the Republicans themselves said they weren't going to approve on the Senate side um, any longer. So yes, we need to find common ground and compromise um, on this, but America will be a better country for a whole bunch of reasons. We will be a more competitive country. There are eight million jobs that still are empty, even with this record high numbers of uh, jobs that have been created in this administration. But there are eight million jobs not filled. Many of them are not gonna be filled by American workers. There's a role for it. If we have a pathway to citizenship, it will attract skilled okay. workers and entrepreneurs to come to this country. And we have a falling birth rate um, here. Immigrants will make up, of the growth in this country in the next 40 years, immigrants will make up 88%, according to demographers, of the growth if we continue to have people at the legal levels that we allow now. So it is indispensable to America. It's good for people like the Jewish community in the long run. Um, and we have to find compromise with this unprecedented challenge that we face on the borders. Tevi? Yeah, so a couple of things. Uh, first of all, uh, Ahavta et Ager, the You Shall Love the Stranger, I think is a very important religious principle. It is a principle, though, that is applied to individuals. We as Jews have to love the, the stranger. Um, and to us as religious people, but it is not a national requirement that we allow people in illegally outside the process or that we allow our border to be overwhelmed. Uh, David said that uh, you know, we, we have people coming over the border like we've never seen. Well, you know, Secretary Mayorkas, who was the Secretary of Homeland Security, bragged repeatedly on national television that he overturned 94 executive orders from the previous administration that had made it harder to come into the country illegally. He bragged about it repeatedly. And then suddenly we have people overwhelming the border. I mean, it, it's not hard to figure out if you stop enforcing at the border, you're gonna see more people come in illegally. Now, my number one goal in immigration is not that we have a restrictive policy or an open policy, is that we have a policy. Right now, we have this insane mess where people can just walk over in the border. They are not adjudicated for years. They're technically not allowed to work, so they stay in the shadows. I mean, uh, you know, I go to New York a lot, and uh, you see these people selling candy on the subway because it's the only thing they're allowed to do. I have nothing but rahmanas for them. I have nothing but compassion for those people. But the system we have says, come into the country illegally, we won't let you work, and then you're just gonna have to work off the books. So we really need to improve the system. We need to enforce the border and not let people come in illegally. And I think we should have robust numbers of legal immigrants so that we can actually plan for how many people are coming into this country. And I do think immigrants provide great strength and diversity and new blood to the country. Let's just let them come in illegally. Let them come in legally. Thank you. Questions from the audience? Okay, Alice. You can stand up and there's a microphone coming your way. I'm, what we're going to do is raise your hand if you're, if you're looking to ask a question. I'm going to let, take three uh, questions, and then we're going to move on to the next subject. Anyone else can want to, looking to ask a question? OK, great. Go ahead, Alice. I, I need some clarification. I'm very confused about originalism, OK? So you have uh, originalists saying that the Second Amendment 
uh, allows Americans uh, to have the right to bear arms. When that amendment originally uh, arose during a time when uh, there were uh, uh, there was a ban on militias and British troops had to be quartered and so on and so forth. And uh, the Second Amendment came out of that original environment. And then you have originalists that uh, do not uh, talk about originalism when they uh, okay. Uh, when they talk about separation of church and state. So you want a clear definition of I, originalism? I'd like to know how originalists can have it in one instance and not in the other. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Another question. Hello, uh, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, we just came out of a pandemic that you know, transformed this nation. Um, how do you think the two political parties did in their response to the pandemic, and I'm also concerned about uh, what we learn from science and research and evidence. How do you think the two political parties did in learning from, from research and evidence to inform good public policy? Thank you. One more question. So both of you mentioned this, but as somebody who thought I was progressive until progressives decided that the Jewish community does not count as the people that we should protect, I was wondering how both of you um, have been able to look past or otherwise deal with the anti-Semitism that exists in both the liberal or progressive and conservative political movements. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much for your question. Tevi, why don't we start with you? Yeah, first of all, thank you uh, for those excellent questions. And uh, I always say to a Jewish audience, thank you for making them questions. So they were, they were, they were terrific. Um, I'll be brief, because I know we want to move on to the second part of the program. But look, in terms of originalism, Elena Kagan, justice on the Supreme Court, former dean at Harvard Law School, has said we are all originalists now. In that period in the 50s and 60s, when, that David loved so much in the Supreme Court, they got away from the concept that the Constitution meant something. Uh, you look at Roe v. Wade, it's not decided by anything having to do with the Constitution. Uh, so I think that in recent years, there has been more of a movement towards looking at the text in the, of the Constitution in making determinations. And I would say that it's true among the conservative justices and most of the liberal justices. That doesn't mean they will always agree, but at least we're looking to the text of the Constitution for the answers, and I think that's a huge improvement. In terms of the pandemic, this is something I worked on extensively when I was at HHS. Uh, George W. Bush was president when I was there, and he read this book uh, by John Barry about the uh, 1918 pandemic. And he said, we don't want to let this happen again. And we put together a pandemic plan uh, that was prepared for it. Um, I wrote about this in my book, Shall We Wake the President, about um, the issues of uh, pandemic preparedness. And look, we had a plan for how to deal with, with pandemics. So it was based on flu. Um, and when the coronavirus came, it, it didn't work. I mean, the, the, all three layers of protection we had uh, were overwhelmed. The international monitoring was number one, and we were misled by the Chinese. Uh, the second one was uh, having uh, controls at the border and testing, and our testing regime was a disaster, and CDC, um, I think, uh, and I don't think this is a, uh, Democrat or Republican, C CDC, the career officials at CDC said, we're going to dominate the testing, we're going to control the testing, we're not going to let private sector entities do it, and it was a complete failure, and we were unable to control it at that level. And then the strategic national stockpile, which is how we counter pandemics, how we, what, how we have countermeasures stored at all times, had nothing, and this is what, what I wrote about in my book in 2016, had nothing for coronavirus. So government failed at multiple levels. And I don't think it was necessarily a Democrat thing or a Republican thing. I think um, you know, there's certainly things that um, the previous president did wrong in terms of telling people about the bleach, which was nuts. Uh, but at the same time, I think he pushed through the vaccine, which I think was, was a huge improvement. So uh, I, I think government was, um, and, and as I said earlier, there are issues with government. Government okay. doesn't always do uh, the best job of these things, and we should be wary of relying on them. The third thing in terms of progressive, one second. Tevin, I will. Tevin, I'm stop. I, I want to let David answer I want to let David respond to the, to the originalist question.
question. Can I just say the progressive thing? Go, go, that's fine. I did two out of three already. Uh, look, in terms of progressivism, I really, I truly feel for you, I'm so sympathetic because I have a lot of progressive friends and they are so hurt by being made to feel unwelcome by this new progressive ideology, this woke ideology that, uh, says, that divides the world into oppressors and oppressed, and we Jews are always seen as the oppressors, and that means nothing that is done to us is at all criticized, and nothing we do is okay, and anything that we do to the so-called oppressed people is seen as oppression by us, and I think that paradigm is incredibly harmful. I think we need to get away from it, and I think the great fight of the next 10 years is not going to be between conservatives and liberals, but within the Democratic Party, within the liberal coalition, are you going, is the liberal coalition going to reject this woke ideology, this, this oppressor versus oppressed paradigm, which always sees America in the wrong and always sees Jews in the wrong? Thank you. Uh, on the originalism, I mean, no, first on the, on the uh, gun control thing, a well-ordered militia was clearly one of the intentional uh, purposes of the Second Amendment. Um, and for a long time, that was the key way that the Supreme Court uh, interpreted it, and then it radically abandoned its prior precedent, precedence and jurisprudence in this area to create an entirely new um, right that it continues to expand in alarming kinds of uh, ways with the subsequent decisions giving more and more rights of people to have guns. The guns that were envisioned at the time that the Constitution was written have nothing to do with the kind of guns that are killing people um, with semi-automatic uh, weapons and bump stocks and uh, the kinds of weapons that we find uh, today, assault-style weapons, uh, <coughs> et cetera. And the notion that we're bound by um, uh, what, what was, if you can't find it in the, in the Constitution or in the amendments as they were done, then you can't apply what the intent of those laws were to something. It's just something that I disagree with. I urge people to read Justice Breyer's book that he has just come out with that is a debunking of the, uh, the approach of uh, originalism. Um, in terms of the pandemic, one of the great achievements of the Trump administration was the vaccine, along with the Abraham Accords that we'll talk about in a moment. Um, uh, here, I fully acknowledge that. The way that they handled it is that, look, I just have a basic thing. I don't think that people, whether we're talking about climate change or we're talking about bleach or we're talking in pandemics and we're talking, I just don't believe that people who don't believe in science um, ought to be serving in, in government. Um, uh, here, and uh, you know, we have too many, um, unfortunately, in government these, uh, uh, these days, and the world is paying a terrible, um, a, a terrible price for it. So um, uh, there are a lot of lessons that came from uh, this pandemic. Hopefully, you know, each time you think, well, we've learned these lessons, and then the next pandemic is different. Um, and uh, you realize that you can never fully predict um, uh, here, but we now know a lot more than we knew before um, about this. And, you know, just as we did through the AIDS epidemic um, here in Ebola virus, and we become using science more and more effective in being able to combat them. Um, here, the, yes, there is anti Semitism on the left and the right. Um, here, most of the violence that has afflicted America and Jewry has come from the right. Most of the violence that has affected any house of worship that has been attacked um, or uh, here comes from the right, um, uh, here, not from the left. Um, uh, here. So I am concerned about the left as you just described it, Tevi. Um, we share those concerns. I think the reductionist occupier, uh, uh, oppressor, oppressed, is too neat a way of thinking about the complexities of structural racism that I truly do believe is a central challenge that we face in America, um, structural sexism that I truly believe we do face in America um, here, and the notion that uh, uh, here that, and we have an obligation to address those, and race conscious remedies is gonna be uh, necessary to combat racism. Um, uh, here, and uh, you know, that just is a, a, a crucial I insight into what we face. I just don't think we ought to exaggerate what is going on. If you read Franklin Ford's stunning piece 
in Atlantic Magazine, in which he says, the end of the golden age of American Jewry. He describes a liberal order I'm talking about as having created an America that, in my words, have given rights, more rights, more freedoms, more opportunities to America, to American Jewry, than we have ever known in all of diaspora life. It was an extraordinary period of time, the second half of the 20th century into the 21st century. And it is under attack by elements of the left, and we have to push back against it. But the answer is not his idea about go get passports to a different country. The answer is fight back. Let's take the liberal vision that we had, that I still think it rests fundamentally with one party as opposed to another party um, in this country, and let's fight to keep it on the track that created the greatest extraordinary experience of freedom and opportunity that we've ever had um, uh, 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 here. So yes, we can push back. I mean, just look at the Congress. The squad is eight people, eight people. You look at the Progressive Caucus, 90-something people um, here, overwhelmingly, they vote over and over again for Israel about it. If you look at the Congress and the Democratic Party of the Congress, this isn't controlled by the woke. It is the Republican moderates who get knocked off in the primary elections. Comparatively few in the Democratic, they lose mostly, the moderates in the Democratic Party lose more frequently in the general election if you look over the last 25 years um, uh, uh, about it. Overwhelmingly, the Democratic Party remains um, committed to the kind of values that made um, uh, America the extraordinary country it was um, uh, for Jews. So let's deal with that anti-Semitism on the left forcefully, confidently about who we are. Let's push back about it. But the coalitions I'm part of in all across the country, across the world, and in, in America um, here, very few of them have been afflicted um, by that kind of mentality um, uh, here. And we're better off winning the battle against those forces on the left and definitely the forces on the right that threaten everything about America that has made America the country it's been for us. Yeah. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. I, 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 Tevi is saying I should make clear that it was Franklin Ford in his article that started talking about get a passport to another country. Um, Tevi and I both want to make America the kind of country that has been so extraordinarily good to uh, Jews. Okay. <laughs> I am reassured. We're all reassured by that. And um, as you know, there's always a little bit of truth in every joke. And so the old joke of what does it mean when a rabbi looks at his watch, the answer, absolutely nothing. So we are, we are running a little later than I thought, but we're going to, so I'm not, I'm not going to do an introduction on Israel. We're just going to move right into it. And Tevi, if you'll give us, yes, please. So 50 years ago, I made my first trip to Israel. I'm, I know I don't look that old. I was very little at the time. Uh, I went right in the aftermath of the Yom Kippur War. And I visited, even as a little boy I recognized, a traumatized country. Everybody was walking around with machine guns. I saw limbless soldiers begging, crying in the street. The uh, country was terribly poor. You could barely make a phone call. There was very little food. Uh, there was no modern infrastructure. I mean, as a seven-year-old, it uh, really struck me that uh, you couldn't get any decent toilet paper. I mean, it was just, uh, it just was not a modern country, and it seemed like a country on the precipice. Well, 50 years later, Israel is a strong country, is a powerful country, is a much better country, it treats its Arab citizens, its Sephardi citizens, its gay citizens so much better than it did then. Uh, we saw, from a defense perspective, just the miracle of this past weekend. You know, in the, um, uh, in the story of the Yitziat Mitzrayim, the coming out of Egypt, it talks about how the Jewish people were protected by the Ananei Hakavot, the clouds of glory that surrounded them and protected them from external assault. Well, I think we saw 
exactly that this past weekend, Ananei HaKavod, a modern day miracle that protected Israel from this very, very difficult situation. The other thing I've seen in these 50 years is incredible diplomatic achievements. When I was there in 74, Egypt was the mortal enemy. We were terrified of Egyptians. Well, within a few years, Israel made peace with Egypt. After that, they made peace with Jordan. In recent years, we've had the Abraham Accords. Jordanian fighter jets were protecting Israel this past week. It's mind-blowing. So I think we get caught up in some of the day-to-day -day horrors, and there are many, and I'm going to talk about them. But we also should see the incredible march of progress and be proud of that as Jews, as American Jews, as Americans, because America is and has been uh, Israel's staunchest ally. So I see the potential for great, I've seen great progress in my own lifetime, and I see the potential for more great progress. Now that said, Israel is also a villa in the jungle, as they say. It's a very difficult neighborhood. I have a cousin who was on Kibbutz Nirim on that terrible, terrible day on October 7th. She actually is the, um, one of the voices of, of Jews in the Gaza area. So she was on Facebook and on the phone telling reporters something is going on here. She was one of the first people to alert the Israeli reporters that th there was a, a problem with the invasion. And um, she hid in her house for eight hours on that day. She heard Arabic voices outside her window. Fortunately, they didn't get into her safe room, but uh, it was terrifying. Her daughters, her granddaughters, were in a house nearby, and they invaded that house. Fortunately, the father had an M16, uh, right to bear arms, good thing, uh, and he shot them at point-blank range and saved the girls. Um, I have, my brother lives in Israel, he has three kids who've been deployed in this very difficult period. So the trauma of it sits heavily with me. I think about the hostages all the time. We, we, my, my wife and I, we have a hostage poster up in our home. And my cousin, who survived, lived in the South for uh, years and years, she's now, um, I guess, exiled to Beersheba, she came to visit us, she saw the hostage poster. She said, I know him. He's a historian, like me. He gave one of the best lectures she'd ever heard about um, the history of uh, astronomical, uses, uses of ast astronomy in determining the, uh, the holidays. And I, I recently learned that he, the Israeli intelligence believes he, he was killed. So, um, so it's, very, it's very traumatic for me. It's very, this is very personal to me, and it is to all of us. We all know people affected by this. And I've been very saddened to see that the policy from the Biden administration has been so muddled. I, I can't say negative, because in the days after September, uh, October 7th, President Biden was strong. He stood up to the anti-Israel voices within his own coalition. He went to visit Israel, even though all his aides told him not to. He uh, resisted his aides who wanted to do a mealy-mouthed, this way, that way speech, and he said, Israel has a right to defend itself. So I was very, I publicly, as a Republican, supported what Biden did in those early days. But since then, the criticism has started and it's become overwhelming. Biden said Israel's actions have been over the top. He didn't veto the resolution in the UN that separated the idea from the hostages from the ceasefire. He, he, they leak conversations to make Israeli leaders look bad. They, the latest thing Admiral Kirby said today is that if the standalone Israel aid package goes through Congress, which I think it will, they would veto it. What kind of ally is this? I don't understand it. And no wonder the Biden administration is being pushed in this increasingly negative depression, uh, di di direction that I abhor. If you look what's going on, the um, top Biden aides signed an anonymous letter criticizing the, uh, the, this country's support for Israel. The interns signed a, a, an anonymous letter criticizing the support for Israel. Capitol Hill aides on the Democratic side are, are criticizing it. State Department aides, including one who resigned, are attacking the uh, administration's position on Israel. Um, and Biden himself has said to Bibi Netanyahu, this is not Scoop Jackson's Democratic Party. Scoop Jackson, many of you remember, was a staunchly pro-Israel Democrat from Washington State. And Biden is saying, this isn't the Democratic Party anymore. And, and it hurts me. I, more than anything else, want a bipartisan consensus, two parties supporting Israel. And unfortunately, 
that is not where, what we're seeing. It's not the direction in which we're going. I mean, in, you guys here in Chicago, um, we're, they're gearing up for activists attacking the Democratic National Convention on the issue of Israel. And we saw the airport, and poor David could barely get to downtown Chicago today from the airport because of pro-Hamas terrorists who are blocking traffic. It's not, not only do I disagree with them, but it's not the American way of protest. You don't block traffic, you don't deface buildings, you don't put bl ha bloody handprints on the White House. And I think we need, as a society, to stand up against it and arrest people who act in ways that are inappropriate. You're not allowed to do this. Yes, we have free speech, but you don't have the free right to destruction. So I'm very concerned about the direction that the Biden administration has been going in recent weeks. And I'm concerned because there is a strategic implication. You know, Sinwar in his little hidey hole, he gets news reports, he reads the papers, and every time he sees the Biden administration criticize Israel, he says, I can hold out. I don't have to give back hostages because the Biden administration is just going to impose a ceasefire for me and I'll have to give up nothing. In fact, today he rejected another potential ceasefire deal. Everybody's hammering on Israel, ceasefire, ceasefire. But Sinwar has rejected every possible deal. Partly, unfortunately, because the, the hostages we fear are dead. And he said, he said he doesn't even have 40 hostages that he could provide. Maybe he's lying. I don't know. I don't trust him for anything. But he gets additional leverage every time the Biden administration criticizes him. And then in Iran, I've already mentioned the miracle of the Ananea Kavo, that uh, Israel was protected by uh, this, this blanket of missile defense, and I'm so grateful for it. But the whole policy of appeasing Iran, giving them sanction relief, giving them billions of dollars, trying, I try and figure out why the Democrats are so pro-Iran, why they're trying to help Iran all the time. And I've read a lot about this, and they have this theory of the balance of power. They want a balance of power between Iran and the Shiites on one side and Israel and the Sunni nations on the other. What do you need a balance of power? One side is your ally, the other side is your enemy. It just doesn't make sense to me to promote this balance of power. We should be for Israel and for the Sunni Arab nations against Iran, which kills Americans. It killed three Americans this year, which killed hundreds of Americans in Iraq. So this idea of the balance of power, I, I think, is very misguided. And I think the Iranians also look at, at what the Biden administration says. They felt emboldened to go and do this attack. Um, and I understand that we were able to defend against it, but defense is not deterrence. And then Biden goes out and says, Israel cannot respond. I don't think that's the right way to protect Israel. It emboldens our enemies. And I should mention that uh, if you look at the Republicans, they are united in favor of Israel. The, uh, it is, the Republicans are so fractious these days, they disagree on everything, they're constantly fighting, but one thing, you can, if you get a room of Republicans, conservatives together, they will agree on support for Israel. And I think that's so important. And I take my guidance on foreign policy from Ronald Reagan. He had a very simple but effective idea about foreign policy. Reward friends, punish your enemies. And I don't think that should be the Republican way or the Democratic way. I think that should be the American way. Thank you. So your comment about Scoop Jackson, I would make the same argument about you and the Republican Party that this Republican Party is not Tevi Troy's Republican Party. Um, <laughs> 50, 50 years ago, whatever it was, 40 years ago, um, beginning in the 1970s, neoconservatives were the most influential component of the Republican Party on foreign policy matters. And liberals and neocons worked together to stress U.S. leadership in the multilateral institutions crafted after World War II to avoid the mistakes that had led to the war, working together to enhance globally human rights and democracy. Sadly, the neocons are a shrinking presence in the Republican Party today. At a time when democracy across the globe is under enormous pressures from autocratic po political forces, we need a Congress and a president committed to human rights and democracy. I leave it to you to think between the two presidential candidates which one is more committed to enhancing democracy across the globe. Let me quote from the widely read politically neutral um, Jewish news media, one of Tevi's favorites, the Jewish insider, um, remembering that 
beginning on October 20th, the president put forward a $14.3 billion aid package to Israel, and it has been blocked every single day since then by the Republicans. Um, here, this is the story from February 14th. Um, Republican hawks turning more isolationists as Trump reasserts influence over the party. Tuesday morning's vote on the Senate floor, which saw more than half of Senate Republicans vote against aid to Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan, crystallized the emerging isolationist instinct in Republican politics, which is now drawing in even some of the most party's most committed foreign policy hawks. It's a trend that seems primarily driven by former President Donald Trump's America First ideology, which has been embraced by much of the Republican grassroots base. That just about says it all. One, it's, the article went on to say, one stalwart pro-Israel, pro-Ukraine Republican senators are following a similar path and voted against the security aid package. Um, first, they tried to tie it with massive cuts to the IRS, shutting down the IRS almost entirely. And that was not accepted by the Democrats of the administration. Then it was border security, which I've already talked about. They got what they wanted and were asking for and compromised on, and then they did a 180-degree reverse um, uh, here. And then when they did try a standalone, the Senate passed a standalone aid package um, uh, here, as Speaker Johnson shut it down um, here. Against this backdrop, let me turn to Israel and the impact of the crisis we face in Israel and Gaza and its impact in American politics. Um, a, a cognitive dissonance, you know, the psychological term for holding opposing ideas in your head at the same time, this crisis to me is a living embodiment for most Jews um, that, I, uh, that I know. Um, here, first, so just a few different points to exemplify this. First, American Israel are two extraordinary countries that have something in common I don't think is true of any other country in the world. That is more people traveled to those countries to make a new life, not just for safety and opportunity, but because those countries represented something that they wanted to be part of. Second, as I suspect is the case with most of you, I am a passionate Zionist committed to Israel's security and well-being as a Jewish democratic state. We share that in common, Tevi and I. But I am also a passionate supporter of a free and secure Palestinian state and believe, even at this bleak time, Israel will never truly be safe nor whole until that occurs, and occurs in a manner that enhances, not diminishes, Israel's security. Third, Israel remains surrounded by forces, including Hezbollah, the most powerful non-state actor on earth, which, if these forces believe they can militarily destroy Israel, they would not hesitate to do so. Hamas, Islamic Jihad, Iran and its proxies, the Houthis, the militias in northern Syria, and Hezbollah, the militias in Iraq. Um, here, Hezbollah, over 100,000 missiles aimed at Israel civilian centers throughout its heartland, each more deadly, more accurate, more long-range than anything in Hamas's arsenal. Only Israel's strength, enhanced by American support, stands in the way of that happening. Reasserting such deterrence after October 7th remains a central strategic goal for Israel in the current conflict. Fourth, Palestinians have suffered under a nearly 60-year occupation that daily oppresses and demeans the Palestinian West Bank population, engendering pervasive fear, despair, and resentment. And Israel and Egypt's control of who and what enters and leaves Gaza has repressed for decades the standard of living in Gaza, who must also contend with the oppressive rule of Hamas, denying them fundamental freedoms, using them as human shields, and diverting huge amounts of supplies over the years for their military purposes. Fifth, those of us who have been to Israel know full well that on that day of 1,200 killed, 3,300 wounded, a day of massacre, sexual violence, mutilation, and hostage taking, followed by Hamas's assertions that it would do it again if they could, makes this truly an existential battle um, for the future of Israel. The effort to decimate or effectively curtail Hamas's capabilities um, sufficiently to prevent it from repeating such attacks is a just war to be fought. Six, Palestinians in Gaza believe just as strongly that they too are in an existential battle. 
and that they are actually losing that battle. That their only chance in the short run not to perish literally from bombing, starvation, or disease to finally have a Palestinian state in the long run requires international intervention. Indeed, the cost to civilian lives has been devastating. Let's cut by a third or a half the numbers that are thrown out. We can talk about why um, uh, here. Yet even with those caveats, more humanitarian workers killed, more journalists killed than in any other conflict on earth. More children have been killed in Gaza since October 7th than in all the conflicts in all countries on earth over the last three years combined now, according to the UN numbers. Beyond the technicalities of just war theory and international law aside, which I wish I had time to talk about, every victim of Hamas's October 7th brutality, Jew and non-Jew, every IDF soldier, dead or wounded, I hold in my heart. These are my people, each one created B'Tselem Elohim. So too every hostage whose freedom we fight for so intensely. And every hostage release is to be fought for, not just militarily, but with all the political, diplomatic, and publicity measures we have, but cognitive dissonance against. For there is a corollary, obvious, theological truth we must not forget. Every Palestinian child, every mother, every father, every grandparent that has died as a combined result of Hamas's culpability in Israel's bombing is also created in the image of the divine. So to the scores of thousands, scores of thousands maimed, their lives and their families who must care for them change forever. So to the hundreds of thousands whose homes and livelihoods were eviscerated, precious possessions lost forever, even more those precious family members lost in their extended family, and so to the 1.8 million displaced, now on the cusp of starvation and disease. They are all children of God as well. Finally, what an extraordinary president Joe Biden has been for Jewish concerns. I've known him for 50 years. He is as true an Ohev Yisrael, a lover of Israel, non-Jewish lover of Israel, as any that I've known. And we have seen it vividly and consistently since October 7th. His solidarity of Israel, his repeated public affirmations that he is a Zionist at a time that Zionism is under attack even by some of his left-wing constituents. His visceral pain over the brutal massacre of October 7th, his anguish for the hostage and sustained efforts to free them, his trip to Israel so shortly after October 7th, first American president to go during wartime to Israel, his deployment of a significant U.S. military presence in the region to deter Iran and its surrogates, and when it was necessary, his willingness to use that force, as we saw so dramatically just a couple of days ago. Next, his facilitating of over 100 aid packages to Israel, of fighter jets and all kinds of weapons. Um, and, and as we learned recently, he's kept that going day in and day out behind the scenes, even while he's been pushing Israel to change its policies. And he's done so... It will stand with Israel even as a growing strains mount with Bibi and Biden taking increasingly different positions on, attack on attacking Rafah without a better strategy to reduce civilian casualties. With President Biden's call for a six-week truth to get aid to the 2.2 million Gazans who need it so desperately before people in large numbers start dying from starvation or disease, a development inimical to uh, international law, to Israel's, to America's values and strategic interests, and I would submit to Israel's as well. I'm proud that we have a president who, in addition to his abiding commitment to Israel, cares as well about Palestinian civilian suffering. Um, the notion that because he is critical, of Israel's policies, that he is urging Israel without holding up support so far one day in this here. So far, he has stood with Israel. He will continue to stand with Israel. But the notion that he should be silent when he thinks Israel is acting in a way inimical to America's interests and values, to Israel's interests and values, um, uh, here and greatly doing damage to the kind of coalition 
that we need to have in the Middle East if the day after we have any chance to move to a lasting peace. The prospects of which are nil today because there's such hatred and suspicion of one side and the other. And yet we all know that if there isn't a resolution to Palestinian national aspirations, mm -hmm. living alongside Israel, there will be conflict after conflict after conflict. And I'm glad that we have a president that sees that clearly, has made that point, even as he stands at Israel, that there has to be a change in the way it's going about it, um, here, lest Israel become such a pariah in the world yeah. um, here that it can't sustain itself. So um, I really think that this Tevi um, it, it's not fair to describe his differences with Bibi and his criticism of Israeli policy um, here made out of what he truly believes is best for America and Israel as any kind of retreat from his commitment to Israel. I'm going to give up my question <laughs> so that you'll get a few questions in. So if you have a question, or let, uh, Abe? Oh, I'm sorry, David first, and then... Sure. Yeah. Um, how would both of you um, advise Israel how to respond to the attack over the weekend? Or is it no response, take the win, as I think President Biden said? That's my question. I'll go first, that's okay. So, uh, first of all, I, I gotta say, I was very happy to see David praise the umbrella of missile defense that defended Israel this weekend, because I know that President Biden long opposed missile defense research, and so did David. I found this very interesting letter. David, in 1985, signed a letter saying, we who sign this appeal are people of faith, but we have no faith at all in the SDI, generally known as Star Wars. So um, I think we always supported um, so uh, I, the Arrow program my turn, my turn, in Iron my turn. Dome. <laughs> anyway, so um, I'm glad that you've come around on missile defense. Thank you very much. It, it proves that growth is possible. So, um, in terms of what happened, you like that? <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> um, it, in terms of what happened this weekend, I said earlier, look, defense, which I admire, is not deterrent. Israel needs to reestablish deterrence. That doesn't mean that they should do what was it Smotrich or Ben Gavir said and go crazy. I mean, you have to be thoughtful and strategic in these matters. And I think Israel should figure out the best way to reestablish its deterrence in a way that doesn't necessarily blow its allies or prevent it from being able to act in the future against Iran or Hezbollah. So I think a careful thoughtful, but forceful response at a time of Israel's choosing is what I would advocate. You know, the, the Hebrew phrase, lahav deal, um, uh, here, the, what a distinction between two things. Those of you who are old enough to remember the mid-80s when President Reagan came up with this idea of a kind of out of space uh, ability to knock down um, uh, the missiles uh, here with technology that there was no chance of having at that time and would have been the costliest weapon system in the history of America. Uh, Tevi and I, from the beginning, supported the Iron Dome project and the Arrow project and the investment in which Israel had supported American support, um, both in providing the um, uh, components uh, that are American-made, but also the financial investment in the development of David and the Arrow programs in Israel. Um, the, um, and it is more necessary than ever um, uh, here. We need to significantly up our production systems um, for all of those defensive uh, weapons. And we just don't have enough for Ukraine and Israel, um, et cetera. So it's vitally important that we uh, work together on that. Um, that's the kind of military expenditure I think we can, uh, we can agree on, Debbie. Um, uh, here, I think uh, Israel will have to decide what it's going to do. From my standpoint, it could have declared victory after this extraordinary achievement 
of its prowess here. Um, uh, here. It made such a powerful point about its capability and its capability to check um, Iran. Iran also showed, by the way, and this has gotten lost in a lot of the commentaries, we weren't sure, we knew that they had long range missile capabilities, but we weren't sure about how targeted um, their ability was to get any large number of drones and other things to Israel. It's a lesson for Israel in terms of that will have enormous impact on its strategic thinking moving forward, one of the lessons learned by this war. The United States wants to avoid a regional conflict. Um, here, if it explodes into a regional conflict, we have no idea what the outcome of that is going to, uh, uh, to be. I think that the Biden administration going after the targets it's gone over, not just two days ago, but over and over again, going after either with the Houthis and uh, in northern Syria, um, uh, et cetera, that uh, I think we've done it right um, so far in this balance and saying we won't sit idly by as you try to stop shipping, as you try to launch missiles, uh, you know, certainly if they're at our targets, uh, et cetera, and Iran was smart enough not to actually try and hit um, an American target again um, uh, here. They want to avoid a regional conflict. It requires a balance. I am really glad that I have President Biden as my president making that decision rather than President Trump. Okay, Abe. So this is a question for our uh, conservative friend. Um, the, um, uh, I just lost my note. But uh, recently, Donald Trump on a, um, a broadcast said that any Jew who supports or votes Democratic hates his religion and hates Israel. And uh, someone who identifies very strongly as a Democrat, as a progressive, as my fr all my friends do, and who come to services for the last 25 years, almost every Shabbat, and who has studied in Israel and has studied text and have taken classes with Rabbi Siegel, how, how do you respond to that trope, which is a universal anti-Semitic trope that Jews have a separate agenda and are not part of the bigger society? How do you, plus, one more point, uh, one of uh, Trump's spokespeople, Stephen Chung, uh, almost any time I read his quote, talking about Democrats, never fails to mention George Soros. So how do you then, as a, a, as a observant Jew, how, how do you respond to that? So two, two things, uh, and thank you for the question. So first of all, uh, I would not be traveling around the country with David if I believed that he hated his religion and he hated Judaism and he hated Israel. So um, you know, I just re reject that. I'm not a spokesperson for any campaign. And, and that's just and not I where I am. that he should be held responsible yeah. for Donald Trump. Uh, um, but, but I do think that uh, George Soros puts himself out there and funds a lot of things that I disagree with, and I don't think it's inherently anti-Semitic to criticize him for doing that, just like I don't think it's inherently anti-Semitic when people criticized Sheldon Adelson for giving a lot of money to Republican causes. So you know, if you're going to put yourself out there, and David puts himself out there, I put myself out there, I recognize that we can be criticized for what we say and we do. If somebody says that Jew Troy, that's anti-Semitic. If somebody says, I disagree with Troy on gun control, abortion, Israel, whatever, I don't think that's anti-Semitic. So I think there's distinctions to be made. Thank you for the question. Th this one actually surprises me a little bit. We usually kind of, we disagree, we agree. This one surprises me a little bit. The meme of George Soros, beyond any specific thing he funds, as kind of the symbol of this conspiracy on the left um, that he is secretly manipulating and it really resonates with the elders of Zion, with, with um, uh, long-standing uh, anti-Semitic motifs um, here. So one can absolutely take issue with some of the groups that he funds, and, uh, or all the groups he funds for that matter, but I think not recognizing that that is going on and it has become a bait noir of, uh, of the uh, right in terms that have overtones, and we saw it in some of the political ads in the last uh, election, et cetera. Um, here, a, a touch surprise about that. 
It depends how you do it. Right? I mean, it depends if you, again, make it about George Soros the Jew, then that's anti-Semitic. If you make it about these, these groups that he's funded that I think have actually harmed the ability to maintain law and order in American cities, I, I don't think that's anti-Semitic. But anti you don't think there's a way that it could, that, that those kinds of conspiracies... Some people do it in ways that, that are... That it signals Soros the Jew? I think some people do it in ways that are distasteful, but I think what I just said is not inherently anti-Semitic. Thank you both for being here. Um, this has been a really interesting um, conversation. So I find that in this moment, Jews are always being asked to defend themselves and their beliefs and their support of Israel. Um, I'm someone who identifies as someone like left of the middle. Um, but I have a lot of friends, especially from college, who are like quite progressive. Um, and I'm wondering, do you think it's worth engaging with these people? Or do you think it is something where we cite historians or professionals like yourselves? There's this concept in some um, minority groups I'm someone who's mixed race, I'm obviously black, and there is this concept of like not having to explain yourself or your history. It's like it's not your responsibility to teach, which is something while I understand where people are coming from, how do you how does someone who is not from your culture, your race, your religion learn if not from the source? So what do you recommend when you're dealing with this on a day-to-day -day basis with the people who you love most or, you know, regular friends? If you want to make, if you want to make this last, if you want to make this last. Sure. So you want me to go first? Uh, thank you for the question. I wouldn't be here if I didn't think there was a necessity to go out and teach and explain and explain my point of view and be here with my good friend David and you know, having this conversation. And I know some of you in the audience agree with me, and that's great. And I know some of you in the audience disagree with me, and I'm fine with that. But you're hearing a different point of view than maybe you're used to. Or maybe when you hear David, you're hearing a different point of view. And, and I think that's good. And I'm very concerned about the balkanization of America, making everything focused on your race, your religion, your gender. I mean, Ronald Reagan is one of my political heroes. You may have noticed that. I've mentioned him a couple times. He used to say this phrase in speeches that I just thought was so powerful. He would say, liberty binds us together. We're not bound together because we're a certain race or a certain religion or a certain gender or like a certain baseball team. We have this shared enterprise. It was, it was talking about people who want to move to America or move to Israel because these are countries that are motivated by an idea. And it's that idea, that shared idea, that government can exist to create the conditions of liberty that allow us to thrive, and that thriving takes place best in this wonderful country. That is what inspires me and motivates me and makes me want to go out and teach what I think is the best way for America, for, a Jew, for Jews, and I think for the world. Thank you. Um, I want to go back to something I agree with um, that uh, Tevi lifted up before. Um, I think we're at a strange paradoxical moment in the history of the Jewish people in which we are still a minority that feels vulnerable because we're in a minority. We are an extraordinarily successful minority that in the main has been accepted in American society in a way that was so unusual in all of um, in all of Jewish uh, history, and you know, so it requires an effort sometime to help people understand why we feel like a minority. Tragically, when there is an expansion of anti-Semitism, it becomes clearer to people. I'm putting aside the left the, now that. It is an ideological uh, uh, attack on us for our Jewishness, um, the the far left. Um, uh, here. But in America, you know, people look at us, 
and we may look diverse by the color of our skin, but we look successful, accepted, integrated fully into American life, et, et cetera. And they just don't understand how we can feel so vulnerable. I think there's a greater understanding of it now. I think that will be helpful to us um, going forward in terms of some of the challenges that we have, uh, that we have talked about uh, tonight. Um, I'm really glad to be able to do this with Tevi. Um, I am really worried about the divisions in America today, the breakdown of bipartisanship. Every great achievement we had in the 20th century came because of a bipartisan coalition of decency in Capitol Hill. We so desperately need that again as we face crises all across the globe, climate change and inequity in our economies and pandemics and warfare and migration at numbers on heard of in all of human history today. There are more migrants in the world, more displaced people, more people moving from one place to another than ever before in human history, and it will probably increase, according to most experts, in the next 30 to 35 years by another 50 percent. We got to tackle these problems. It requires comedy. It requires willingness to find common ground and to make compromises to move forward. It's in that spirit that we've come here. We differ. Um, uh, Tevi gave great responses to my litany of the things the court did. But just remember, in the main, every conservative legislature in the country reduced the constitutional protections. The purpose of civil rights laws was to give a base. If you want to do more, you could do more. But we give a base of what nationally has to be required. And as soon as that went, because the court struck it down, women's rights and minority rights, black rights in this country were getting reduced all over the country wherever conservatives were in control. It's an important election. It really is. Who's going to appoint the next judges? Who's going to set foreign policy? Who's going to stand up for Israel? Who's going to stand up for equality and justice and freedom um, in our country? Tevi makes a good argument why if conservatives of his ilk were there, they would do a good job. I hope that we can appreciate the liberal order that Franklin Ford talked about and work together to restore it and build it up so that the golden age of American Jewry will continue. In conclusion, I want to just take a minute and talk about how unusual and how refreshing this evening was. To hear, to, to sit and listen to a conversation, to hear people offer well-reasoned arguments that are very different than one another and do it civilly without being demeaning, without belittling, without name-calling is sadly the exception and not the rule. So I leave tonight a little bit more hopeful about what we can do if we choose to. I want to end by referring to the same text that I began with, the Elu the Elu text. You'll recall that Hillel and Shammai had an argument that lasted three years, and that argument was ended by God interjecting God's self, maybe tired of listening to these endless arguments, saying, Elu ve'elu divrei Elohim chayim. These and these are the words of the living God. But then the text goes on and says, but Hillel was right. <laughs> And listen to how the text continues. A question was raised. Since the heavenly voice declared both these and those are the words of the living God, why was the halakha established according to Hillel? Both of them are the words of the living God. Why should Hillel be right? The Gemara continues. It is because the students of Hillel were kind and gracious. They taught their own ideas 
as well as the ideas of the students of Shammai. Not only for this reason, but they went so far as to teach Shammai's arguments first. Would that we learn from the house of Hillel. Ideas need not be radioactive just because we don't agree with them. To engage with ideas is what has made Judaism what it is. To be involved with a machloket, l'shem shamayim, to be involved with arguments that are going to take us to a higher place, that is what we call Judaism. And I want to leave you with the notion that we have a we have a message for the larger world, and it's contained in this ancient text. Let us be students of the house of Hillel and teach and listen to both sides of arguments so that we can join together and create a country that is worthy not only of its own values and create a state of Israel that is worthy of its own values in partnership with American Jewry, but also worthy of God's presence as well. Can we take you with us? Thank you very much, everyone.